Radio. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And verse 6 says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Look, when my daughter was a little girl, she asked this compelling question. If God created everything, then who created God? And me not being as spiritually mature as I am today said, sweetie, God just is. Well, now that I know more about God, I can share with you today who God is in today's message entitled, God Is. Now, according to the Bible, God is not a mystery. He is not enigmatic, esoteric, or inexplicable. In fact, the Bible gives over 20,000 references providing almost infinite detail of God's personality, his power, his passion, his position, and his plan for mankind. See, many people twist the word of God, making him unapproachable and unreasonable and unlovable and even unforgivable. Especially they ask this question, is God real? If he's real, where is he? Or where was he when someone was raped? Or where was he when someone was maybe murdered? Or, or they lost their job? Or they lost a loved one? Or they became sick? They said, where was God? And so to them, God is not real. And God does not love. And God does not help. And God is not forgiving. You see, the Bible tells us, in fact, God himself tells us about himself in his word. And it's important for us to search out his word to understand who he is. When we look at that word, God, God in itself, God, it means deity or divinity. The general term used for God means God himself, whom we worship, and then false gods as well. When we look at that word Godhead, it's one word, Godhead, it is the manifestation of God to humankind. His, it's him manifesting himself so that we may know him in a deeper way. He is Father, he is Son, and he is Holy Spirit. Now we know this to be the Trinity. Now the Trinity is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible, which has caused uh, some controversy among faiths, especially mainly non-Messianic Jews. If we go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, the Bible says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one. One. Now, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, back at verse 4. The Bible says, Hear, O Israel. In fact, Moses writes what God is saying. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, let me read it to you in the Hebrew. Shama means hear. Yisrael, O Israel. Yehovah Elohim, Ichad. Yehovah. Now, the word Ichad is the Hebrew word for one. It means a single entity, but get this, made up of more than one part, a compound unity. Ichad means to unify, a collection, to be united into one. So, we see the word hikad and it means one with more than one part. It is confirmed by the usage in the Hebrew word or the Hebrew language 
Elohim, which is translated as God. But Elohim is a plural word, meaning more than one being called God. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16. And I want you to stay along with me. Now, the Bible says in Isaiah 48, verse 16, Come near to me, hear this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. God said, I'm an open book. I want you to know me. I want you to know all about me. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Now, I want you to look back at that verb have. That verb have in Hebrew, that verb is singular. So it's like saying in our English language, I have. Now, when you have one or more, two or more, uh, then what you say is we have or they have, just like we have translated and now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. But if we look at it from the original text, the Hebrew verb being singular, then it is I have sent me. So the subject verb agreement most likely translates to I have sent me. And we know who that sent me is, is Yeshua, Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when we're talking about the triune God, He's coexistent and co-equal, all in God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit coexist and are co-equal in God. It's just like saying husband and wife come together to become as one. Now, the Bible in Genesis chapter 2 explains it this way, that they're comparable. So if they're comparable, that means they, they are equal, but different. They have different roles. They do different things. They are different people, but they still come together as one. That's why the Bible tells us even if a husband and wife are married and they have children, they may be one family, but that husband and wife are still one because once the children grow up and they go out in the world, they're going to become one with someone else in marriage. Well, business partners are another example of coming together and becoming as one, one business, one company. So you have partners coming together equal in authority. And then members of the body, members of ministry or in ministry become one body. And we see this and we saw it last week in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, where Paul writes, and, and remember Ephesians is the unity book, the unity book bringing both Jew and Gentile together to become as one. But in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says there is one body, and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. He had, I and my Father are one. There is an uh, African adage uh, pronounced Umbutu, and Umbutu is very interesting. It means I am because you are. And a story was shared with me about a missionary who went to an African village, and there were children there, and the missionary had a large basket of fruit. And he put that basket by a tree and he told the children, the first one who runs over there and makes it to the basket can have all of the fruit. Well, the children looked at each other and they grabbed each other's hands and they ran together and they ate together. And the missionary said, hey, why did you all grab hands and run to the fruit when one of you could have had the whole basket? And they said, umbutu. And he said, Umbutu, what is Umbutu? And they said, I am because you are. I am strong because you're strong. 
I am filled because you're filled. I am happy because you're happy. I am because you are. Now Jesus says in John chapter 17 verse 11, he says, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. He's talking about the believers and I come to you. So Jesus was making preparations to uh, die on the cross and then ascend into heaven. He says, I'm making preparation. So he's having this conversation with God the Father. And he says, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And it's very interesting that now, not only Father, not only Son, Holy Spirit, but we also become one with them. You see, the body of believers is the bride. Remember I said, it's like unto husband and wife. The body of believers is the bride. And Yeshua, Jesus, is the bridegroom. You see, throughout the entire Bible, there's marital uh, references about our relationship with God. And he says in Jeremiah 3 and 14 that he is married to the backslider. And in Romans chapter 7, verse 4, Paul explains it this way. Therefore, my brethren, brothers and sisters, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Yeshua, Jesus, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. And in essence, you know, Paul isn't talking about uh, marriage per se and divorce per se and dying for real. He's what he's saying is dying in the spirit, finding ourselves on the cross with Yeshua. When we find ourselves on the cross with Yeshua, we die and then we raised up. But the reason why Paul writes this to help us understand this, that if we're married to the law, the law is a very hard and harsh husband. He doesn't help us. But, and the only way to separate ourselves from the law is to die. And the law would not die because the law lives forever. So who has to die? We would have to die. And if we die in Christ, we are raised up again with him and now we can be married to Yeshua, to Jesus, and Jesus helps us. In fact, he sends his Paracletus, Holy Spirit, to be with us, to guide us, to even dwell within us, Mino, in us. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29, Paul also writes in the Unity book, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church for we are members of his body now this was added into the passage uh, it's not in the original text of his flesh and of his bones verse 31 says for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32, now I want you to pay attention. Then Paul continues to write, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So Paul says, when I'm talking about this, I'm not necessarily talking about husband and wife. I'm talking about our relationship with Yeshua that that's how it is, that we become one, as if we are one flesh and one bone with him. Now in Revelation chapter 19, verse seven, and it's very interesting how our relationship uh, resembles the relationship or a marriage or a Jewish marriage. Many of our traditions stem from a Jewish marriage, but that's how uh, Yeshua, that's how our relationship with Jesus as we are the bride and he is the bridegroom. And the whole, you remember the story about the 10 versions with the oil, half of them didn't have oil and the other half had oil or, or half of them didn't have enough oil. And the Bible reminds us that we should be ready when Jesus returns. So when we go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, it says this, John the Revelator writes, 
Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. You see the, the five virgins who had oil, they were ready when Jesus came, when the bridegroom came. And so the forerunner, uh, John the Baptist says, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming and he's coming, he is coming. He's coming back for us. Verse eight says, and to her it was granted to be a ray in fine linen, clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And so John says, this is what God said. This is the truth. We also find God is personal. God is love, the Bible says in 1 John 4 and 8, but not every love is God. And so we have to be clear that the, the love God is, is unconditional love. Yes, agape love. We learn love through his actions of love. We love him because he first loved us. In fact, he demonstrates his love in John 3, 16, of, giving his son as a sacrifice, we see his unyielding, unconditional, never wavering, unfailing love through his sacrifice. Now, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five. And the Bible says this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you know, Jesus teaches us how to love God this way. He says by calling him Abba Father. We don't see this in the Old Testament that it is so personal that we will call him Father, that we will call him Papa, that we would call him Daddy. That's intimacy. In Galatians chapter 4 verse 4, the Bible says, but when the fullness, when the Moad, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So he becomes our father too. Verse seven says, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but you are children and children, then an heir of God through Yeshua, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 12 and 50, the Bible also says, for whoever does the will, and this is Jesus speaking, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Jesus also says in John 14 and 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In Deuteronomy chapter six, verse six, and these words, which I command you today shall be in your heart. And we say, what words? These instructions that he gives us concerning keeping his commandments, all of his commandments. He gives us 10 commandments in Deuteronomy chapter five. Three, connected to him being one God. Have no other God before me, he says. Do not make carved images and don't take the Lord's name in vain. But he also instructs us to keep his word and share his word with our children and share his word with our neighbors and to have his word on our doorposts and have his word in our minds and in our hearts and on our hands to write about it, to talk about it, to walk and share his word every day. God is a jealous God. He doesn't share his authority nor his power with any other gods. He will not contend with you wanting to wash your cars on Sundays or Saturdays whenever your Shabbat is. He will not contend with you wanting to do laundry. He will not contend with you wanting to go hang out and go to the movies or go to the mall. He is a jealous husband who wants those who have committed to him to stay committed to him. In Isaiah 43 verse 10, 
The Bible tells us, You are my witness, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. He is a God of covenant. In fact, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus says, For where two or three are gathered together in his name, he shows up. He's in the midst. So he's concerned about the covenants that we make when we come together. God is invisible, but yet he is visible. God is invincible and indestructible. He is a creator. He is the creator. He is self-existent and self-sufficient. He is a strong tower, a consuming fire and spirit. God is merciful, forgiving, holy, and just. He is sovereign. He's the great I am, infinite, absolute truth, righteous, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He's all powerful, all knowing, and he is everywhere. God is not in time. Time is in him. Before there was a beginning, God was and is. You see, God is reminds me of a song I learned years ago by James Cleveland. And it goes something like this. God is the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. He'll never, ever come short of his word. I've got to fast and pray, stay in this narrow way. Keep my life clean every day. I want to go with him when he comes back. I've come too far and I'll never turn back. And then God is, God is my all. Leno. So God is whatever you need him to be. He's El Shaddai, God Almighty. He's El Elyon, Most High God. He's Adonai, he's our master. He's Yahweh, Lord and Jehovah. He's Jehovah Nisi, he is the banner. He is the blockage that blocks us from the enemy's forces. He's Jehovah Ra, he's our shepherd. He's Jehovah Rapha, he heals every wound. He's Jehovah Shama, he is there with you. He's Jehovah Tikanu, our righteousness, Jehovah Mekadish. He is the one who sanctified. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Shalom. And he's Elohim, God with more than one part. In Isaiah 44 and 6, the Bible tells us, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no other God. In Hebrews 11 and 6, the Bible also reminds us, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. As I close out, we ask this question, who is God? He is inexhaustible endless, timeless, tireless, limitless, never ending, forever and eternal. God is my all in all and I pray that he is your all in all as well. He is real and he is alive. Hi, I'm Laura Amison with Trinity Plus One Transportation LLC. We are a state certified, bonded, licensed transportation provider for the cities of Hopewell, Petersburg, Colonial Heights, Chester, Richmond, and the counties of Prince George and Chesterfield County, Virginia. If you're tired of unknown arrival times of other transportation providers, contact us, Trinity Plus One Transportation. We transport to medical facilities, 
places of employment, day support centers, just to name a few. Schedule with us your ride. We provide door-to-door -door service. Let us be the one to transport you to your important destinations. Call us at 804-479-4007 or visit us and like us on Facebook at Trinity Plus One Transportation. We look forward to hearing from you. I pray that you received a clear understanding of who God is. I wish that I can go deeper and share more, but you have to experience him for yourself to really know him. And so if you haven't received Yeshua, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is your opportunity to receive him today. If you will, just accept him into your heart by saying, I receive the Lord Jesus into my heart. I am a sinner and I ask for forgiveness and I know that he will forgive me of my sins. I believe that he died on the cross and I believe that God raised him from the dead and he is our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer. If you have said these words, then you are saved. Now link up with a good church and learn the Word of God. Read every day as much as you can. And I believe Holy Spirit will reveal many things to you and your personal relationship with God will be your testimony to the world. God bless. Dr. Yeoman.